said anything that is controversial or threatening or difficult to understand. Now, certainly I've said a lot of things that could be taken out of context and misinterpreted. Have I said anything to you that the world might consider hate speech? Or have I been willing to speak the truth in love, even if it hurts or offends some portion of our culture? Let me assure you over the next several weeks, I intend to take a stand firmly on the Word of God, establish principles, and some will be offended by my words. Some of you and some of those who will watch may have difficulty with what God says, not what I say. Hopefully it's not my opinion that I'm bringing and presenting to you, but it's the Word of God and if the word of God offends you, maybe you should be offended. God's word. Our guidance on this subject should not come from, uh, from our pastors. It shouldn't come from mismanners or from the advice columns. I've seen a lot of bad advice printed in the newspaper. Sometimes I read it just to find out if they've firmly planted themselves in the Word of God. The only place for us to find help in especially confusing times is in the Word of God. Second Timothy, Paul writes to his young protege and says, gives him warnings about the, the time that we're coming and understanding our time that we're in. 2 Timothy chapter 4 first, and then back up to chapter 3. But in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, it says this. Paul writes, the Holy Spirit has inspired. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Amen. Instead, to suit their own desires... They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, falsehoods. Look back at chapter 3. Paul says that there will be terrible times in the last day. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. Treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Now Paul was talking about the days that were just to come after his own, and yet he accurately describes our days mm -hmm. as well. Each of these passages accurately describes our culture. But our culture is not unique. <clears throat> the same factors that are affecting the United States right now have been in operation in Western Europe for the last two to three decades. They're ahead of us. But that doesn't mean it's a good thing. In every culture and society that has fallen by the hourglass of history, that is no more, that is vanquished from the earth, that is forgotten to all but the archaeologists, this is exactly what has happened. The moral failure and the collapse of the society happens from the inside and that allows the enemy to come from the outside and deal with the final blow. 
each culture has come to a defining moment when a choice was faced. Will there be reformation or revolution? It was faced in the, in the land of Assyria, in the town of Nineveh, not known for its godliness, not known for its adherence to godly principles. And yet when Jonah came into town and preached repentance, they listened. They had reformation that day. They had a change of heart from the king down to the lowest in the city. And God saved them. But just a generation later, there was revolution. And they were overthrown by Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon because they had turned away the God that they had served. We are standing in such a time as this when we must choose reformation or revolution. And it seems like in the culture of these United States, revolution is winning. Paul wrote to Timothy to encourage him to warn him, to prepare him for the day and the time when people would no longer listen to the truth. Truth, by definition, does not change. It is just what it claims to be. Truth is not relative. It does not mean one thing to me and another thing to you. Truth just is. You either stand on the truth or you walk around the truth, but either way you have to deal with the truth. If there is no truth in this world, then even that statement is false. So there must be truth. It cannot be otherwise. Here's the difference. Some people don't like the truth, and so they begin to alter their presentation of the truth, or they ignore the facts and the facets of the truth that might sting their conscience. And anything but the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, is a lie, a falsehood, an untruth. Eventually, this is something that communists propagated during their reign in Russia. Stalin said, if you repeat a lie often enough, people begin to believe. Their hearts have become hardened against that which is real, that which is true, and they've accepted less than the rock-solid truth that has been revealed for all the world to see. Some of them will even try to change the Word of God to suit their own misconceptions. It's happening every day. People wonder, how do I know the truth when there are so many different versions of it out there? My dad used to make a statement, I may have said it to you before, I'll tell the truth ten different ways before I lie about it. It was reflective of our times. It was my dad's way of sarcasm, I suppose. Anyway. I had a conversation with a friend this week, and he gave me a couple of great compliments. First, he said, you know, I like talking to you. I think we can talk about anything and disagree and still leave the room as friends. He doesn't come to church here. He doesn't really attend church anywhere. I would question if he's made a profound change in his life. But I responded to him, you know, I really hope so. I don't try to offend anyone, not on purpose. But some things I say, you may find. Offensive. I just won't say them in a way that's 
purposefully offensive. Later he said to me, he said, you know, you seem like the kind of person who's accepting of a great many differences in others. To that I replied, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm at the church. Why I'm in the church of God is because we believe that everyone who is a Christian is our brother and sister. That whatever building they go to, whatever name is on the building, if they believe in Jesus, they belong with us, with me. I belong to them. There's only one church. When we get to heaven, there won't be four or five or six or twenty or two hundred. There's one church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. We may not see eye to eye on every point of theology, but if we have the basics in common, Jesus, crucified, risen, Rainy. We're on the same page. However, just because you claim to be a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you go to church doesn't mean that you're going to heaven. I like to say it this way. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to the bar makes you a cat. There are a lot of different interpretations in the Bible on a good number of theological topics, but there are a good many non-negotiables as well. And if you seek to justify some sin, any sin in your life, and claim that God will turn a blind eye, you are sorely mistaken. And that doesn't give me permission to be rude or uncaring. That doesn't mean that I'm allowed to offend you for no reason, but when it comes to, as they say, brass tacks, I'll tell you what God said. And if that pierces your soul, it's because He intended it to. I don't have to condemn you if you're living in sin, you're condemned already, the Scripture said. And yet if I warn you, gently and caringly, if I approach you with dignity and humanity, you may better receive the message than if I smack you over the head with it. I suppose what I'm saying is this, I'm not out for a fight. But if you start one, you better have all your facts straight. Because I'm going to rely on the Word of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus talked about the light of the world. When Jesus spoke again to the people, the Scripture says, He said, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Three things to note in this passage. First, Jesus is the light of the world. Light, by definition, is illuminating. And when Jesus says He is the light of the world, we believe that by Him and through Him all things were created. It was and is by Him that the sun shines in the daytime, and the sun shines in the nighttime on the other side of the world. He brings the light. We also believe and teach that Jesus is the light for our understanding. If we truly want to find meaning and understand light, we must turn on the life light. The scripture says that Paul prayed that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would know the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of His calling and His great love toward us. 
Studying the pattern found most plainly in Jesus as recorded in the Gospels is the best way to learn and understand and see how to live. Secondly, those who follow Jesus have the light of life. It is impossible for anyone who is truly following Jesus to live in darkness. We rest in His light, in His understanding. We follow where He leads, and that is obedience. We trust that His way is best, the truth. We don't question, or if we do, we will eventually acquiesce to His way, to His will. The presence of obedience, our obedience to the Word of God, is evidence that His light is shining in us and shining through us. Number three, those who are not following Jesus are in darkness. They don't understand the instructions of God. They don't understand the character of God. They think of God as an evil ogre, as someone watching over their shoulders seeking to punish them. They don't really understand that God wants what's best for them. That God wants to give them the best things in life. They presume to believe that God is love, and that means He'll overlook and forgive all of their failures. But they fail to understand that God is also just, that He cannot and will not abide their sin or disregard it forever. Eventually, judgment must come. Darkness implies confusion. Darkness leads us to believe that we've grabbed onto something firm and solid only to find out that we have the wrong thing. The picture that comes to my mind is of the three stooges. They're after the bad guy. They're after the criminal. They're after the deceiver. And somehow the light gets knocked out. And in the confusion, they wind up catching each other. And the bad guy gets away. You can see it. As well. Darkness causes us to believe that we're standing at the top of a mountain awaiting the sunrise only to find out that we're sitting in the bottom of a pit. It's confusion. We don't know where we are. We don't know how we got there. And we certainly don't know the way out. Now it's easy for us to condemn those who are in darkness. Those who have light can see clearly where the mistakes are being made. Those who have the light can see the path before them. Those without it stumble and fall because there's a root, there's a hole, there's a trap waiting for them. Yet our aim and our purpose, our goal, is to also be the light. The light that can lead others out of darkness and to the one true light. And yet, if somehow we repulse them by our judgmental attitudes and our condescending tones, they may never come to ask about it. Because we presume that they have consciously rejected the truth, it is sometimes more difficult for us to have compassion on those who are trapped in darkness. Now, if you're in a dark place, wouldn't it be nice if somebody turned on the light? Wouldn't you appreciate it if someone had the decency to shine a light into that dark place? One surefire way for us to have compassion on those who are still in darkness is to remember the darkness that we have and the joy that we found when the light shone into our lives. If we can remember those who reached down into the darkness of our pit, 
who reached into the darkness of our soul and began to open the light of life for us. We can recall the beginnings of hope that we felt. The illumination that came to our spirits and our souls. And even though it pointed out our faults and our failures and our inherent condition of sin, the kindness and the compassion of the light was like a magnet drawing us closer to it instead of repelling us away from it. What we need when we're in the pit is not someone who strolls along and reminds us that we're in the pit. Oh, look, you fell in the pit. Yes, a little help. What we need rather is someone who will reach down and offer to help us escape. Sinners are by nature slaves to sin, but unless we are attractively pointing them to Jesus, they will never find the freedom, the release, the joy, the forgiveness, and the wonder that comes from living in the light. It's my desire to tell you the truth. Not just to speak to politics or our mistakes or to political correctness, but to shine the light of understanding in your life so that God can reach you where you are and take you where you should have been all along into His glorious presence. Where the light dispels the darkness. Where the soul that is sick is healed and made whole. And I hope to do it surrounded by love, motivated by love, grounded in the truth. Thank you.